I've talked a lot about the virtues of volume. In the pursuit of muscular size and physical strength, it's in the average trainee's best interest to get used to doing a lot of work, to not pack it up after that top set of deadlifts, to include some variety of squatting and pressing exercises, and to actually experience life beyond the five rep mark. As valuable as volume is for getting you through those awkward developmental years, there is a point in your training life where a dash of strength specificity can launch your numbers to the moon. Think of all of that base building you've been doing as the stocking up of cryptocurrency in anticipation of that next big boom. Volume is the delayed gratification. It's the hodling, committing to the long-term game by building up your stash now. These tricks I'm about to show you, on the other hand, are the one-off trips to Vegas that you take with your boys when you finally cash out those sweet, sweet crypto gains. Thing number one, visualization. Now this sounds like hokum to a lot of people, but visualization is a powerful tool for lifting heavy poundages sooner rather than later. Many might associate this with some type of manifestation nonsense, but you wanna think about this like a rehearsal for the big performance you've been cast in. There are a few methods of visualization, but they usually involve closing your eyes and running through some type of semi-hypnotic tactic that's going to make your body still and increase the focus and awareness in your mind. Just the act of physical visualization of sort of imagination of that motor skill, it's, it's about 50% as effective as physical performing it too. You then run through every detail of your lift that's coming up and you do it in as vivid detail as you can. You want to go over the smell in the room, the music that's playing, your emotional state, the determination that you feel. And then once you get in that state, you want to start going over step by step in painstaking detail exactly what your execution is going to look like. Mentally running through your rituals and practicing all of your cues has been shown to actually be a viable training effect. The odds of your success increase vastly. Thing number two, compensatory acceleration. The big obstacle with barbell movements is getting them moving in the first place. The habit we generally pick up is to push hard at the start just to get the bar going, and then we take our foot off the gas in order to coast to lockout. It's actually really great for sustaining reps and getting more work in at a given weight if we're trying to do a lot of volume. It's kind of like jogging versus sprinting in that respect, but it's really crappy for conditioning violent intent and increasing force production. Continuing a big neurological drive all the way through from the midpoint to lockout is really important for optimizing strength and potentiating the amount of weight that you can push. You want to use compensatory acceleration to reinforce technique and to improve follow through. So I recommend using this on your warm up sets. You can always warm up with really fast, aggressive movements that keep you tight on the way down, change direction aggressively, and keep you punching through the entire way. You can use density sets like clusters or even on West Side style speed work, provided that the weight does get heavy enough that you experience that mechanical tension. You wanna feel that resistance through the midpoint. While it would certainly increase difficulty on like higher rep, higher volume work, it would also fatigue you a lot faster and it would reduce the volume greatly. So that would kind of work against the point of that type of high rep volume work. So you wanna keep that in mind. Thing number three, irradiation. Pavel talked about irradiation in his book, Power to the People, and I haven't really seen it pop up much since. The idea is that squeezing a muscle as hard as you can leads to all of the surrounding musculature contracting as well in a way that provides a lot of extra stability. So think of closing a really hard gripper. As you squeeze as hard as you can, you're gonna notice your bicep and tricep contracts. And the harder you squeeze, that's going to move all the way up into your delts and even into your lats. Without stiffness along the entire chain, force from one area doesn't get transferred efficiently to the next. So with a squat, bench, or deadlift, it's like hitting into the bar with a sack of potatoes instead of a brick. Squeezing the bar helps with lat tightness on deadlifts and benching, which can be a huge game changer with really heavy weights. And bracing hard against the belt throughout your entire midsection right before a big squat or deadlift actually helps bring in your upper back and your hips. So just like compensatory acceleration, you aren't going to maintain this on a lot of reps, but warmups and anything under five reps is a really good opportunity to reinforce this until your default mode on any heavy attempt is going to make you stiff and rigid and basically a force transferring machine. Thing number four, singles on repeat. Singles are the most strength specific application of training that you can engage in to prepare for a big one rep max. The problem with them is that they can't be done for a lot of volume. 
heavy weights can only really be done for a few sets and only racking up a couple of singles isn't going to be a big enough stimulus to really grow you muscularly. So if you reduce the weight just enough so that you can actually rack up more total sets and do a lot more total singles, what you end up with is volume applied to very high intensity. And that mix is a recipe for fast growth. Keep in mind that the aggressive overhaul this is going to give your nervous system is also going to make it unsustainable with really heavy weights. So you want to use these types of protocols for very short phases. You wanna keep the weight manageable and you don't wanna grind any reps. The closer you get to that really high max effort threshold, the less time you have before you have to table this one. Thing number five, pauses. Great for volume. It allows you to change direction quickly so more weight can be used for more total reps. But the stretch reflex that's used on a touch and go redirects kinetic energy by turning your muscle tissue into a makeshift slingshot. And this gives you an advantage at the bottom position, which also reduces training stress there. Pauses break the stretch shortening cycle by making you start from a dead stop without the buildup of kinetic energy. So the muscles have to fire without that advantage. This is exponentially better for conditioning starting power and rate of force development. So your start at the bottom of a bench, at the bottom of a deadlift, it's going to be much better if you practice pausing with heavy weights at that position. Pauses require you to be somewhat fresh, so they should be the first or second movement that you do, and they really shouldn't be done when you're gassed from the first movement. Thing number six, holds. Rack holds and walkouts expose the entire nervous system to more weight, which is going to be a theme that you notice when it comes to getting quick strength gains. These were historically used by powerlifters in the weeks going into a meet, and part of their effectiveness was in how fast the lifter adapted to them. It didn't take a lot of weeks before the weight started feeling lighter at lockout. Anyone who was typically shaky walking out their squats or unracking a bench would find themselves more secure really within just a few sessions. Note that these increase confidence and stability at the beginning of the lift. They are not great for deadlifts because deadlifts start at the ground, so you really don't get that transfer. And you want to also note that while the sensation of the weight being lighter at lockout is a huge benefit, it does little to condition the nervous system at other parts of the movement. So this is why this is primarily a trick used by specialized powerlifters, and it's really only used right before a big meet as opposed to year round. Thing number seven, overloaded eccentrics. We are extremely strong in the lowering phase of any given lift. The estimated range is between like 80 and 150% stronger. We can exploit this by focusing solely on the negative in order to get quick short-term adaptations in the nervous system. I knew a coach who used to start athletes out with tempo eccentrics on deadlifts to jumpstart their nervous system going into a heavy phase of training. A block would start with a few total reps of controlled negatives that would get close to and sometimes over 100% it didn't have the recovery hit of actually doing regular reps at 100%, but it still created a similar neurological change that made them feel more ready to get to work earlier in the block. Now, these are taxing, so don't anticipate knocking off a bunch of eccentric squats with 110% and still being able to finish your heavy squat work as usual. These can be done after the main work for the day. So an example would be if your regular benching is gonna go up to say a top set of three, followed by some back offsets, you can actually finish with a couple of five second really heavy eccentrics with weight that went above your top set for the day. It doesn't necessarily have to be super maximal. I would only recommend they be done first if it is in a lighter phase of training. Thing number eight, partials. These have a similar effect of holds, though partials will actually contribute to the strengthening of different ranges of motion rather than just getting you to experience more weight in your hands. It's great to set the height at a weak spot that usually only feels weight when the bar has momentum on it. So you can consider like mid shins or at your kneecap on a deadlift or halfway up on a bench press. It's also good for exploiting the mechanical advantage. So you can get the feeling of firing the muscle under a heavier weight. Block and trap deadlifts, board and pin presses, box and pin squats, these are all really good for getting your nervous system used to handling more weight and for strengthening the weak areas that may exist depending on where you set the bar. I recommend using this in a hypertrophy phase as a secondary movement after your main work and I would emphasize getting comfortable at weak areas in these lighter phases. You want it heavy-ish but with more crisp reps over a few sets and holding that is more important than just feeling strained. Now you can use these in a strength phase after the main lift for repeating working sets of three to five or as your main lift for one to three. You can use them on a second day aimed at strengthening the lockout and loading up the weight and you want to go heavy on these. You want strain to take priority. Thing number nine, 
max isometric pushes and pulls. This is another tactic from the mind of Josh Bryant. Max isometric work involves going as hard as you can against the bar while it's against fixed pins, so the bar doesn't go anywhere. With partials, the position is only under tension long enough to get the bar started. In some sense, volume at that particular point is low and requires a lot of touches and a lot of repeating sets to really condition strength there. But when you're going against the fixed pins, the time spent working there allows you to get up to max force production at that particular point and hold it there for longer. So the training effect is a lot more aggressive. You can also pair it with light, fast, full range work immediately after. Josh Bryant routinely has people do maximal pulls against pins with the bar set at mid shins before going right into a speed deadlift with reduced weights. It really does feel like you grew a second gear. Thing number 10, post-activation potentiation. So this is one of the best applications of all of the neurological stressors that we covered here. When you lift heavy first, then go into a lighter lift, you're actually going to be stronger with the lighter weight. So with holds, partials, negatives, and so on, it's almost always a really good opportunity to drop back and get some heavy work in a full range of motion. Some easy ways to do this include doing an AMRAP after a top set of a normal lift. So for instance, if you hit a top set of three or five on a bench press, you can drop back and do an AMRAP at something that gives you 10, 12, 15 reps, and you're going to be stronger and get more reps in that weight than you would have if you just went into it cold. A good example of post-activation potentiation is recommended by Travis Mash, who used to use heavy bands when he trained at West side to work up to a maximal single. He would then take the bands off and now with the reduced load at the top would work up to another heavy single hitting a heavier weight that he would have otherwise done because he experienced so much weight at the top with the banded variation. But the thing to consider is anytime you overload your nervous system, it is a really good opportunity to go into a full range of motion and reap the benefits of those short-term changes. So that's all I got for today, guys. These are my 10 tips for increasing strength right now. Again, this assumes that you are beyond the beginner stages, that you have some experience, that you've built that base out. But if you guys apply these and get good at them, you get comfortable at them and you watch them increase, you'll be absolutely amazed at how long it is before you start throwing around weights that previously felt really heavy and even undoable. So leave your questions and comments in the comment box or better yet, take it to Patreon. That's where I update my training weekly and where I answer questions from you guys, form checks, training advice, life advice. You can bring all of that over there. Thanks so much for watching guys. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.